Hello, my name's David Windle. I'm assistant head teacher and English lead at the Charles Dickens Research School. The Charles Dickens Research School is part of the Research School Network. We work in collaboration with the Education Endowment Foundation to participate in research projects and deliver evidence-based training to schools across London and the South East. Today I'm going to introduce you to the Educational Endowment Foundation's guidance report on improving literacy in Key Stage 2. I'm going to talk through the recommendations in the booklet and also suggest ways that you can make them work in the classroom, plus make some recommendations of my own in, in terms of books that I've read and things which I think support the work in this guidance report. There are numerous guidance reports on the EEF website and they're all compiled um, through a review of the best available international evidence. So every strategy in these is evidence-backed and research-informed. If you'd like to find out more about the Educational Endowment Foundation's guidance reports, you can find them all on their website. The Improving Literacy in Key Stage 2 guidance report is broken down into five key areas. Speaking and listening, reading, writing, assessment and diagnosis, and targeted interventions. The five key areas are then further broken down into seven main recommendations. So we're going to look at each of those recommendations in turn and see how we can apply them in the classroom. Recommendation number one is from the speaking and listening part of the report. It is to develop people's language capability to support their reading and writing, for which there is extensive research. This recommendation stresses that speaking and listening are at the heart of language. They're the foundations not only for reading and writing, but also for communication and for thought. So every time you're asking a child to articulate something, every time you're engaging a child in a high quality conversation about a text or an idea, you're encouraging that child not only to think but to articulate that thought and therefore to form that thought more clearly. If we lack language, we're not able to participate in the world. And if we lack the ability to put the language together, we're not really in a position to clearly think and to articulate our, our thought processes. So speaking and listening underpins all of the further language skills we then go on to, to practice. The report recommends some strategies you can use to help children develop both their expressive and receptive language in order to support their thinking and then therefore their reading and writing. The first one is giving them a chance to articulate their ideas before writing and this can be done through talk of course and through scaffolded sentences. It can also be done through drama or through interviewing children. It can be done in lots of ways. It can be done with as much fun as you can find. Another thing is listening activities to develop inference skills. This can be as simple as listening to class books and then having a conversation about that. By reading to children, you're not making them process the words, you're not making them decode. They're just listening and using those higher order inference skills to understand the text. Explicit teaching of new vocabulary. This is a really important one. So if you know they're going to be exploring certain words in an upcoming text, it could be in any lesson, you can teach those words beforehand, you can explore them and explain them. Teach vocabulary explicitly, you're giving children the language to access the learning and to think about that learning for themselves. Finally, exposure to a language-rich environment. This is a key one. Words should be everywhere, across the curriculum, across the school. Constantly a point of conversation should be language. In this way you're immersing children in the language they need. There are lots of ways you can explore spoken language in the classroom. A great start in terms of vocabulary is with this book, Closing the Vocabulary Gap, which suggests a step-by-step -step process for how you can help children to expand their range of vocabulary. For example, one of the exercises in it is a ladder like this, which gives you a series of steps to work through with any word to help the children understand them and to explore that language. One of the key things in this I've found when it comes to explaining the meaning, step three, is it has to be a child-friendly definition. Quite often in dictionaries, the definition is just as confusing as the word itself. It's full of other words a child will not understand. So explain the meaning by relating the world to children's own experience and having them understand it in the context of their own life. There's only one recommendation in the speaking and listening part of the report, but I think it's interesting that it is the first recommendation and that the speaking and listening underpins all the other recommendations the report makes. So moving on to recommendation number two, which is from the reading section of the report. 
support pupils to develop fluent reading capabilities. And the key word there is fluent. The developing of fluency as a reader is a really important skill. When a child can read fluently, they can use the appropriate stress and intonation. They can understand the text almost by reading it appropriately. This frees them up to think for themselves about the text. They're not stuck trying to decode words and pick the part of text at that more basic level. The EEF recommend a balanced approach to teaching reading and fluent reading based on Hollis Scarborough's reading model, the reading rope. You can see that word recognition forms an essential part of reading, but by the time children are in key stage two, most of them will need more help with their verbal reasoning and their vocabulary, as discussed in the previous recommendation. How do we teach fluent reading? The report recommends that children need to be taught how to read fluently explicitly and not left just to practice on their own. A couple of ways they suggest this, firstly is through teacher modelling fluent reading, listening to a teacher read fluently on a regular basis. Another way is through repeated reading, so a teacher models the fluent reading, a child reads the same piece of text back to them, mirroring and mimicking that fluency. There are lots of other things you can do, such as choral reading, everybody reading together. Drama is another useful tool when it comes to fluency, considering the intention behind the language can lead to an understanding of what makes the language flow and why it should be said in a certain way. Recommendation number three is also from the reading section of the report. Teach reading comprehension strategies through modelling and supported practice. These strategies can be used in any lesson and with any kind of text and they can be used as a whole class activity, they can be done in small groups, they can also uh, be used one-to-one -one when you're working with a child one-to-one. -one. And these strategies are prediction, encouraging children to predict what might be about to happen next in a text or to predict what a text might be about, which encourages them to monitor the text closely and to check their understanding. Questioning. This is where pupils are asked to generate their own questions about a, a text in order to check their comprehension of it. Clarifying. Where there are areas of uncertainty for a child, it could be around word meaning or the understanding of a particular passage or a phrase or a scene, then you can discuss and clarify those things. Summarising. This is a really useful one. Asking children to summarise what has just been read or to pick out the key information from particular pieces of text. You can use graphic organisers to do this or illustrate concepts with diagrams. Inference. Pupils infer the meaning of sentences from their context and the meaning of words from spelling patterns. So using their inference skills to understand a text. Activating prior knowledge. This is a really important and useful one, I think. Children often have a lot of prior knowledge of a particular subject or a text type or a story or an author or experience from their own life which could be matched over to the context of the text that you're reading. This information is really important to activate because it immediately places that text in the knowledge world that that child has already, bridging them into that text. The report recommends that you explicitly teach children each of these strategies, enabling them to then use them themselves. This can take quite a long time and they advocate a gradual release of responsibility model whereby the teacher slowly fades away their input and the children are able to apply these strategies themselves to any text that they have. Ultimately, you want a child to integrate all of these strategies into their own system for reading. Another key issue in this part of the report is to ensure that the text children are reading are suitable for them, that they are challenging enough and provide opportunities for children to practice these strategies. Is the vocabulary suitable? Is there sufficient content there for their background knowledge to be activated in order to access that text? So where you choose your text from is important. There's lots of reading lists out there, lots of organisations which recommend books. A really good reading list that we've found is the Reading Reconsidered Reading Spine, which suggests books based on five plagues of reading, he calls them, which each plague is a different challenge for a child to overcome when reading a text. 
Recommendations four and five from the writing section of the report. Teach writing composition strategies through modelled and supported practice. This one, this recommendation really does sort of encapsulate the whole writing process in one recommendation. And it starts off with writing for a purpose. Purpose and audience are central to effective writing. And the research backs this up. Pupils need a reason to write and to have somebody to write for. There's a really excellent uh, document by Michael Tidd called Writing for a Purpose, which defines various purposes for which children might write. And in every single unit of, of English that you plan, you need to be thinking about what is the piece that they are writing? What is the purpose of it? Who are they writing it to? Is it somebody in the real world or is it somebody from within the fictional world of the text that you're working on? They need to have a purpose. Then the recommendation goes on to define the underpinning sort of foundations of what writing is for anybody, not just for children, and that you should teach these and teach this process to children. It includes planning as a starting point. Any writer plans their work. Drafting. Once you've planned it, the children then need to be taught through the process of making a first draft of that piece. You might need to teach vocabulary and sentence structure along the way so that they understand the, the skills they need in order to draft their work. Sharing. Sharing ideas or even draft ideas throughout the writing process, exchanging ideas with each other and giving each other feedback, a sense of collaboration on a piece of work. Evaluating. As you go along, and as the children go along, they need to be encouraged to check that they are on the right lines, that the work they're producing is what they think it is. And peers and adults can contribute to this evaluation process. In a way, they're developing here a sense of awareness of the writing process they're involved in, and checking in about how successful they're being as that goes along. Revising. This is a really important part of the um, writing process for anybody. Once you've written your first draft, you're then encouraged to make changes to the content in the light of that feedback and, and evaluation. So writing is not just one shot and it's done. You have to keep layering on the, the language and layering on the content. Editing. Once you've revised, made changes to the content, the next thing is to edit it to make sure it's accurate and to make sure it makes sense. Check spelling, check grammar, capital letters, full stops, all those things need to come into the editing process to make sure that it is, it is um, fully formed as a piece of writing. And finally, the final point of any writing process is publishing when you release your work into the world. So this system underpins writing and professional writing across the board. The report suggests that we train children in this system. Gradually, these skills are taught, focusing on each skill one at a time. Over time, again, it's that gradual release of responsibility model. Teachers need to fade away their input, leaving children to be able to go through this process themselves. And in that way, they have become writers. They've assimilated the process of writing. Develop pupils' transcription and sentence construction skills through extensive practice. This one's really important because, as it says there, a fluent writing style supports composition because pupils' minds are freed up, so they're not focusing on handwriting, spelling, and sentence construction. They're directed towards the piece of writing they're working on. So how do we do this? Well, it's important to teach handwriting and to have extensive and regular practice of this fundamental skill, or typing if children are using computers. It's got to be motivating and engaging, which is a tricky thing with some of these basic skills, but how do you do it? by having motivating and engaging units, by having children engaged by the texts that they're reading and the stories they're exploring. It all comes back to the imagination. If the imagination is engaged and is engaged in a purpose, then the child will be motivated by that. Also supported by effective feedback. So feedback needs to be focused and relevant to the child at that particular moment. It needs to be timely. They need to receive the feedback on their work, which enables them then to change that work, to respond to the feedback, and to correct that work. So handwriting is one thing to practice. The report also recommends sentence construction is something which is necessary to be practiced. For example, doing sentence combining or helping children build up 
to multi-clause sentences and producing more and more complex and sophisticated sentences at speed without having to spend their time constructing that sentence. A great way into this is with a couple of books, Alan Peets using sentence models there. Once you have a look at Alan Peets' book, which lists lots of different sentence types you can teach, well, I realized that there are sentence models everywhere, and if you have a good text, you can pluck them out, and children can use sentences which are written by professional authors as their models, and mimic those sentences until they become their own. Another fantastic book is The Writing Revolution. This one links right the way back to our speaking and listening recommendation at the beginning of the report, because it provides certain sentence stems and sentence structures which enable children to think through language. You could use this to structure your talk for writing, and then you can use it here as a way of practicing sentence models. A sentence model like that, with a scaffold, is a very easy way of enabling children to explore sentences and to develop more sophistication through their work. The report suggests that a guiding principle for feedback should be mark less, mark better. They suggest that feedback should be focused and specific. It doesn't have to be written feedback, it can be live feedback given to the child in the moment, enabling them to respond to that. An excellent piece of research by the Charles Dickens Research School was this booklet here, Mark Less, Mark Better, which goes into how you can be effective at giving live marking. Recommendation number six is from the assessment and diagnosis section of the report. Target teaching and support by accurately assessing pupil needs. In this part of the report, as a teacher you're encouraged to be as forensic as possible in examining and assessing where your pupils need support, which part of the reading or writing process are they struggling with, and how can you adjust things in order to meet their needs. The report suggests two changes that you can make. One is changing the focus. So for example, you might identify that a child is struggling with decoding and therefore you could change the focus of the teaching. A good suggestion that we've used a lot here is toe by toe, which is a structured phonics approach, which can be inserted as an intervention if a child is struggling with decoding, for example. Another change, rather than changing the focus, is to change the approach. So you're still teaching the same lessons as the rest of the class is getting, but some children may just need more scaffolding. Looking back to the sentence structuring and sentence modeling of a previous recommendation, you could simply not fade away this support, not release the responsibility to the child as quickly as you do for other children. So it's about carefully monitoring and assessing each child to understand where they're finding things difficult and applying a strategy at that particular point to support them with that. Recommendation seven is from the targeted interventions section of the report. Use high quality structured interventions to help pupils who are struggling with their literacy. The report says, and experience will back this up, that most children at this point will be able to access the learning through the classroom teaching, especially if you've applied all the recommendations and strategies so far in the report. Of course, there'll always be some children who need a little bit of extra support in order to make progress. And the report suggests using structured interventions to help these children. There are a few key recommendations. One is that the interventions are brief of about 30 minutes and regular. They happen often, three to five times a week. It suggests that they're delivered by extensively trained staff, staff who are experts in delivering that intervention. That has a huge impact on the progress of the child. The interventions must be structured and have supporting resources and clear plans. They mustn't be vague. There should be regular assessment to identify the pupil's needs, to pick up on specific difficulties and to track their progress. It's really important that the interventions are additional to the classroom learning, but they are linked to it in some way, that they're linked to normal lessons. So the child can make that link themselves and not regard the intervention as just some kind of contextless add-on. And finally, really important again, building on the previous point, connections made with the in-class learning. 
that the intervention is built out of what's going on in the classroom and that the child can see how they can use what they're learning in the intervention in their classroom work. The whole objective of interventions being to get the child back into the classroom, accessing the learning at the appropriate level and making progress along with the majority of students. The report itself doesn't go into a huge amount of detail as to which interventions have the most impact, but it does suggest a few places you can have a look to find out for yourself. One of which is of course the EEF website, which has many recommendations on it. Another website they recommend is Evidence for Impact, which has an evaluation of all the intervention systems that are used in the country at this point. Thank you very much for listening to my introduction to the Improving Literacy in Key Stage 2 Guidance Report. I hope you found it useful. If you'd like any further information or training, do get in touch with the Charles Dickens Research School.